So yeah, I'm here to talk about open source hardware licensing and a little bit about the kind of how it works and how it doesn't work. Sure. Yeah, that works. Uh, how it works and how it doesn't work. And oh, look at that. Uh, <laughs> and to the extent there are holes in it, what we're trying to do about it. So as Sophie said, I'm the, among other things, I'm the president of the board of the Open Source Hardware Association. For those of you who don't know, the Open Source Hardware Association is a volunteer-based organization, and it's designed to be a kind of community organization for the open source hardware world. And the goal is to kind of take and, and drive consensus around issues that are important to the community, both to create a single place in the community where people can find things, but also so if someone is new to the world of open source hardware, they can get information and get up to speed and understand the things that people who are already in the world of open source hardware might already understand. So one of the biggest things that we do every year is the Open Hardware Summit. Uh, and that is, uh, two years ago it was in Rome, last year it was in Philadelphia, next year it's gonna be in Portland, Oregon. And it's just a place for people who care about open source hardware to get together and talk and see what's going on. As you can imagine, and as you all know, while it's great to be able to connect online using the internet, especially with hardware, it's especially valuable to actually physically be in one place. And I will, I will shamelessly put in a plug, if you want to come talk at the Open Hardware Summit in Portland this fall, we are accepting uh, proposals right now. So go check out the, the website for it. The other thing that Oshawa does that's, that's big is we're the home for the open source hardware definition and the best practices. And this is, uh, again, a community-driven, consensus-based document that's trying to define exactly what it means to be open source hardware and best practices for how to implement open source hardware. It's been translated into a number of different languages, and what it intends to do is to say, okay, if you're thinking you want to do open source hardware, but want to know what that really means in practice, this is the place to go, and this is the place to get that information. Another thing that Oshawa is doing, and I will use the Open Source Hardware Association and Oshawa interchangeably, because it's hard to say Open Source Hardware Association over and over. Uh, the other thing that Oshawa is doing is working on an actual open source hardware certification. Uh, we don't quite have the logo yet, so all you get is this blank rectangle, but I promise that uh, it, it's coming. It's coming actually very soon, probably within the next week or two, we'll be able to put the logo up. And I'll explain why that certification is important later on in the talk. Uh, this is a picture that uh, I cut from the rest of the talk, so I don't even remember why I put it there, but it's, it's in this deck, so enjoy it. Um, <laughs> so when we're thinking about open source hardware and software licenses, and I apologize, the next five minutes are gonna be slightly grounded in a legal discussion, but I will try and make it not horrible and legally. So hold my hand and we'll get through this together. When you think about open source hardware, the open source hardware community is grounded in so many ways in the open source software movement. The open source software movement, uh, many of us have been part of it, many of us have used it and benefited from it, and a lot of the norms of the community are driven from software. And in a lot of ways, that's really fantastic. But in some ways, hardware and software are different. And so what it means is we need to find ways to change the norms from software into something that makes sense for hardware. And licensing is, is one of those ways. So there are a lot of disputes within the open source software community about which licenses are really open source software. I'm not touching that dispute. Uh, I, I don't wanna have that fight, I'm sorry. But we all know what that fight looks like. The important thing for this talk is that when you're talking about software, software is completely protected by copyright. And so if you're using a copyright-based license for software, you are controlling the entire work. And that has a bunch of implications. And in some ways, that was actually a problem in software that licensing was trying to, to fix, right? Software is born closed. 
because of copyright. Copyright is automatic. It automatically applies to software. It locks it down. And so in order to give people permission to use it, you actually need to give them a license to give them certainty. And so software licenses do two important things. One is for the person who wants to use the software, it gives them clarity that if they want to use the software and they comply with the license, they're not going to get sued for copyright infringement. It also gives the user, the designer, I'm sorry, of the software, clarity, and they say, I'm going to release this software out into the world. I'm going to put these conditions on that release. And if someone uses the software and breaks those conditions, I actually have a hammer to come after them. I can go after them for, for copyright infringement. And so what happens with software and copyright and licensing is if you think it's open source, it's largely self-executing, right? If you have the piece of software and the source code and you have the copyright license, you essentially have all the information you need to understand if it's really open source software. Right, you can decide if that license meets your definition of open source software, and if it does, you have everything you need to use it. Because you've got the software, and you've got the license. You've got the code, you've got the license, you can go and do it. Things get more complicated when you get into the world of hardware. For all sorts of reasons, <laughs> some of which are legal. One of the things that gets more complicated with hardware is that hardware is not all encompassed within the scope of copyright. A lot of the important functional parts of hardware are not eligible for copyright protection. They're just as a category of things outside the scope of that. I'm not going to get into the technical details why. For now, you'll have to take my word for it, but we can talk about it later if you have questions. And also, if, you're, if you have hardware, you don't necessarily have all the information you need to make use of it in an open way. Which means that hardware and open hardware isn't self-executing in the way that open source software is. So what does this mean? If you use existing open source hardware licenses, and this is not a criticism of those licenses, I think it's, it's sort of a recognition of where they sit in the world, those open source hardware licenses can give a lot of clarity to end users, because what those licenses today basically say is, I, as, an end, as a creator, I put this out in the world under these conditions. If you make use of it, I won't sue you for copyright infringement. But what today's open source hardware licenses don't do a very good job of, for creators, if they think they're putting their work out in the world, conditioned on the limitations built into the, into the license, saying anyone can use this as long as they continue to be open. Anyone can use this as long as they share their, their innovations on top of it. Because the, a lot of the hardware is not based on copyright, if someone else comes along and violates the license, there's no way to punish them. And so the expectations for people who are creating hardware and for using those licenses, who think what they're saying is, I'm putting this out in the world, and everyone has to use it within the limitations that I'm giving them, actually don't match up with their ability to punish someone who breaks the, quote unquote, breaks the license. So this is an expectation setting problem that's a real problem in terms of licensing. It's actually, in some ways, it's a great thing. It's a side effect of the fact that unlike software, Hardware is largely free when it is born. It only gets protected if you get a patent on it or if some of it is protectable by copyright. And so by default, to use hardware in a lot of ways, you don't need a license. But because we're all coming from this open source software place, it becomes very complicated when you start thinking about these licenses. OK, so I asked you, I said, this is going to get a little complicated. We're going to walk through this legal part for five minutes. Hold my hand. We've all made it. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, so I want to talk about how we're trying, thinking of ways of solving this problem. If you accept that it's a problem, that open, so fundamentally, open source hardware licenses 
don't have the same kind of control over hardware that open source software licenses do. One of the things that comes out of that problem is that open source hardware as a definition isn't self-executing in the same way. It means that if you're just holding hardware that says it's open source hardware, you can't verify that it's open the same way you can with software. And so just to illustrate this, and this is, I, I didn't want to pick on a company, so I decided I could pick on the CIA, right? The CIA could say, we're doing open source hardware, but we're not going to share anything about the open source hardware. Right now, besides the fact that they're the CIA, so you probably don't trust them, it would be hard for you to tell if they really were doing open source hardware or not, because it wouldn't be inherent in the hardware they're distributing whether or not their schematics are open, or whether or not you can access their, their bill of materials and things like that. And so this problem started to appear where all sorts of people were running around and saying, we're open source hardware, we're open source hardware, we're open source hardware. But when you looked closely at what they were doing, it didn't look like they were using the open source hardware definition, which is maybe a problem. But the bigger problem for users is when they heard open source hardware, they heard one thing. But when the person was saying open source hardware, they were saying quite another. And so there was sort of dilution of the term. And so this is where the Open Source Hardware Association is trying to step in and be helpful. And to be clear, what Oshawa is trying to do is not lock up the term open source hardware. Anybody can use the term open source hardware. Nobody owns that term. It's out in the world. And that's actually a really positive thing. But what Oshawa is trying to do is to put together a certification mark. And again, this is not the mark. The mark isn't done yet. It's going to be done soon but this is close enough. Ash was going to come, trying to come in and saying, look, we have a certified mark. And if your version of open source hardware matches our version of open source hardware, matches the community version of open source hardware, matches the definition of open source hardware, you can use this mark on your project, on your product, on your advertising. And so then if you say, this is open source hardware, all of your users, all of your customers can look and say, oh, well, there's that certification mark there. And that means when they say open source hardware, it's what I think of as open source hardware. So this is what we're trying to do. Uh, what have, what, so where are we in this process? And this is, let me skip around a little bit. So about a year and a half ago, we put out a bunch of questions to the community because there are a lot of different ways you can do a mark like this. And we said, these are the things that we're struggling with. These are the things that we're trying to figure out. Please weigh in and answer your questions. So we got about six months worth of feedback. And last fall at the Open Hardware Summit, we released the Open Source Hardware Certification version one. You can find this on the website. It's all there. And what it basically did is it laid out how we were going to approach the certification, the kind of theoretical construct of how it was going to work. And when we did that, we highlighted a bunch of key things. There were a bunch of key decisions that we made. One was, if you were going to call yourself open source hardware, it had to really be open source hardware. It couldn't be, we're going to open source this, or when it's done, it will be open source. And we saw this a lot in the context of Kickstarter campaigns, where people would say, yeah, yeah, we're open source hardware. And what we mean by that is if we get funded and we get the first run done and we scale up, then we'll release some schematics. And they're like, no, 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 no. If you're using the certification, it's because today when you're using it, you're actually open source hardware. The other thing that we, that we worked on was how to handle open source hardware projects that have mixed elements to them. So projects that use things like proprietary chips or you know, they've got a blob that does Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. And there were a couple different ways you could have approached this. We could have said, if you have proprietary components, you're not eligible for the certification at all. We could have said, well, there are tiered levels of certification. So there's you know, certified bronze and silver and gold. And as you move your way up the chain, then you're more open 
But ultimately, based on the feedback that we got from the community, what we decided is it's better to have a binary system. You're either certified or you're not. And there are a lot of important projects that use, binary, that use closed components because this is the hardware world and there aren't always open alternatives. And so what we decided to do was say, was use this concept of your contribution. So if you want to use the certification mark, if you want to call your stuff open, your contribution, everything in your control has to be open. Your schematics, your designs, your bills of material, all that stuff, that has to be open. And when possible, you should use open components from third parties. But if you use closed components from third parties that you don't control, you don't have an obligation to open those components because you don't have the ability to open those components. <laughs> and so all you can say is, this is the closed component that I used. And so as long as your contribution is open, you can use the certification. Now the weight of that obligation is different depending on who you are. If you're someone who's building something in a garage, your contribution is gonna be limited to the schematics that you design, and maybe the programming that you did, layout, things like that, because you don't have the ability to open source your chips. You don't have your ability to open source all the components that you use. If you're a big company that happens to be in the chip manufacturing business, and you use one of your chips, then your obligation is heavier. You have to open source that chip. Why? Because that's your contribution. You have the ability to open source it. And then the last part that we had to decide on was enforcement. And what we ended up doing with enforcement, and Oshawa is enforcing the mark. It's, a, it's trademarked, it's protected. We did a gradiated sense of, of enforcement. And the idea was that on one hand, we didn't want to be in a position where people who were good faith actors, who just messed something up, we're going to get a lot, in a lot of trouble quickly. And so there's a lot of steps if you're triggered, if an enforcement action is triggered against you, where you have an easy opportunity to fix things. On the other hand, we also needed a way to make sure that if somebody was a bad actor, we had a way to punish them. And so if you work your way through the system and continue to violate the terms of the license and abuse the trademark, then you can be fined. So where are we now? Uh, a month ago, or sorry, a year ago, we released the, the high-level certification. Since then, we've been working on turning it into real legal language, a real binding license to use the trademark and to register the trademark. So this month, or June, if we're in, are we in June yet? June, in June, which is either next, this month or next month? Next month, next month. Uh, next month, we're gonna release what we think is the final version of the mark. Uh, and of the license language for community review. Hopefully we think it's done, but we'll find out. And we'll also start talking to people who are interested in being launch partners, who want to be involved at the ground level when we roll it out. And then once the summit comes around, uh, which is October 7th, <laughs> um, we will announce the whole thing is being done and open. And so what that means at that point, you can, anyone can use it. And what does using it mean? Using it means the first thing you do is you self-certify. You look at the license, you look at the terms, and you say, yes, I, my project, my product complies with this. The second thing you do is you register. And you register, when you register, you formally agree to the license to be able to use the logo. And you fill out a form that says, here's a URL for our documentation, here's all the information that you need, Here's all the things, here's where you can find all the stuff if you wanted to use this, this product in an open way. And then you also get a unique identifier. And so when you sign up, you get the right to use the logo for the certification and a unique identifier that you use with that logo. So then if someone finds the logo on your project or on your product, they can actually look it up on the Asha website and find all the documentation, find pointers to all the information. And then you go out and use it. You put it on your boards. You put it on your stuff. You put it on your advertising. And it's out in the world. And right now, this entire process is free. Uh, we have no intention of charging for it. 
Uh, we don't know where it's going to, it's an all volunteer organization. We don't have any intention to, to charge for it. Uh, who knows where it goes, but you know, right now that's not the design. And we're just hoping to have people use it. And it becomes a really, hopefully becomes a really useful resource for the community when you start hearing people say, this is open, this is open, this is open, to really be able to go back and verify that it's useful. And that hopefully will help with part of the problem and the gap in open hardware licensing right now, where what people think they are doing with licensing doesn't necessarily match up with the actual terms of the license. It doesn't solve the problem, but what we hope it does is it at least puts out a kind of complete package problem and solution set in and of itself, so people kind of understand what they're getting involved with. So that's, that's where we're going with it. That's where we are with sort of the licenses and the certifications. Um, if you want to call me stupid digitally and in public, uh, Twitter is the best way to do that. If you want to call me stupid digitally and privately, uh, email is a really good way to do that. And if you have any questions or you want to call me stupid to my face in public right now, uh, I can take questions now or talk about this later. Also, if you have other questions about uh, Ashwa, I'm here and my colleague Catherine uh, in the back is also here. She's going to be talking after the break. But if you have Ashwa questions, either of us are happy to answer that whenever. So thank you for your attention. And thank you for sitting through the lawyer part of this presentation. Everything else will be better, I promise. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Thanks a lot for your talk, very interesting. Uh, just a short question, the licensing itself, is it open source? Yeah, um, I mean, it depends how you define it. So the license for the, for the trademark is open source in the sense that the license will be public. And if someone else wanted to fork the, the technical bit of the license and apply it to something else, yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, if you want to use our logo, you have to comply with our license terms because without that, the logo would be meaningless. But the sort of back-end stuff is, yeah, totally available. But so if I would like to start uh, like my own certifying system, I could um, like fork your results or whatever? Yeah, you, I mean, okay. you know, you, you change the relevant bits where it's you instead of us, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, if you figure out a better way to do this, more power to you. <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Some question. Here we go. So someone probably has to ask the question. You said uh, open hardware is, is not protected by default. So would, would all those non-protected parts be protectable by patents? And, on, and as a second thing to it, would supporting the, the, this license uh, be something useful to have uh, something similar to what Mozilla did with the open so open software patent license to have uh, if you use the uh, our patents you only can use them in open stuff yeah so to take sort of both questions uh, the first question is potentially yes right so if you can th you you can think about the world at a high level as being broken up into two categories of things things that are categorically eligible for copyright protection and things that are categorically eligible for patent protection. And so if you use that rubric, all the parts of hardware that are outside of the scope of copyright are at least as a category of thing eligible for patent protection. Uh, it's a lot easier to get copyright protection than patent protection. And so for any given thing, the answer is maybe, but at least as a kind of, as a way to see the world yes, they might be eligible for patent protection. On the second question of having kind of like a portfolio of patent licenses around open source hardware, I think it's a really interesting idea and a couple people have played with it. I think the primary, there are probably two primary challenges with a patent portfolio like that. One is that 
getting a patent, which is locking something down just for the purpose of reopening it, like ideologically is an interesting decision to make. It's one that, it's one that can work. And if, if, you are in some, if you are with an organization that kind of patents things by default, then it can be really useful. But as a kind of big community step, it, it's, it's an interesting ideological approach. Um, and the second part is that patents are really, I mean, copyright is free. Patents are really, compared to that, copy, patents are really expensive. And so the idea that if I'm coding in my, in my apartment, I have all these copyrights that I need to do something with. If I'm building in my apartment, I don't have a lot of patents. And I don't know that I'm going to prioritize spending you know, tens of thousands of dollars or euros to get a bunch of patents, and then just to contribute it into, the license, into, into a portfolio. And so, and to make it to third part answer to your question, um, if we made it easier to get patents on open type things, on kind of you know, uh, hobbyist scale or small company scale uh, hardware, that would also make it easier for people who don't care about openness to lock things down with those patents. And so while there's a really strong instinct, a reasonable one among people, especially who have a so open uh, source software background, to think about bringing more patents into the process to make the licensing cleaner, I think in the long term, relying on patents as open source hardware movement would actually have the impact of closing more things down, which would be kind of an unintended side effect. Uh, but you could do it, and people are talking about it to the extent those patents are, are out there. Sorry, that was a long answer to that question. But.